In the early 19th century, a radical artistic movement made a deep impression on the creative arts in Western Europe. This was the age of Romanticism, and in cities like Paris, painters, writers and musicians all sought a new sense of passion and emotion in their work. They included a man who became the greatest French artist of his day. His name was Eugène Delacroix. Delacroix was in touch with the spirit of the times. He was familiar with many romantic figures and an admirer of Géricault, the first great French romantic artist. He loved the poetry of Byron, and the composer Chopin was one of his closest friends. Delacroix's own work revealed a similar sense of passion. His was an art of drama, movement and colour. His achievements also include exotic African-inspired art and some horrific paintings of contemporary events. By his early thirties, images like this had made him the champion of French Romantic painting. Although he paints pictures, often with the most extreme violence and sensuality, you always feel he's in control. He's painting using colour a lot. He's using lots of sensuous effects, but he's showing that you need intelligence to do that. Villacroix's main achievement was to have renewed the whole grand scale of French academic tradition, really, by allowing those elements, sensuality, colour, energy, dynamism, those, if you like, elements that have been neglected by previous exponents of that tradition, to fuse with the more traditional elements of that tradition, grand scale conception, rhetoric, etc. And I think that in doing so, Delacroix opened up a whole set of new possibilities for the grand scale painter. He's often focusing on subjective areas, areas that affect the individual, but which we can relate to ourselves. But having said that he was a great innovator, he also had one eye on tradition all of the time. He knew his history of art, he knew what previous artists had done. He was actually the last painter in the European tradition of serious historical subjects. Delacroix himself, I think, would like to be remembered as a painter of the mural projects. It was in that respect that he saw himself as part of a tradition of grand masters of European art. Eugène Delacroix was born in Paris on April the 26th, 1798. At the time, Paris was still in the throes of revolutionary change. Just five years previously, King Louis XVI had been put to a dramatic public death, and the government who ordered his execution included Charles de la Croix, a minister who would become Eugène's father. At least, he was officially the father. In 1797, Charles de la Croix was appointed ambassador to Holland, and his fourth child was born while he was abroad. He may also have been absent when Eugène was conceived. For 200 years, it has been rumored that the artist's real father was another member of the revolutionary government, a far more powerful figure who became a legend in the history of diplomacy Charles Tyron. When Delacroix was in middle age, the rumour emerged that his real father had been the Napoleonic politician Talleyrand. The rumour started, I think, because Delacroix had a slightly odd conception and birth. Not long before Delacroix was born, his father had a very long operation to remove an enormous tumour from one of his testicles. And so later commentators have thought that because Delacroix was this slightly odd individual and quite mysterious that perhaps his birth and conception had had um, odd circumstances attached to it as well. Of course it was strongly rumoured that Talleyrand was particularly friendly with his mother at the time of his conception and birth but I think it's more important to stress how Delacroix 
far from being, if you like, a romantic outsider figure, was very much the product of and grew up in and maintained links with kind of rather grand cultural political traditions. And he was, you know, privileged really in his network of people that he knew and established relations with. Charles de la Croix died in 1805 while serving in the city of Bordeaux and shortly afterwards the family returned to Paris where Eugène enrolled at the Lycée Impérial. He received a classical education, developing a passion for literature and revealing a talent for sketching. It was this that led him to study with the academic painter Guérin in 1815. The following year, he enrolled at the Paris School of Fine Art and his career was launched. At the time, French painting was influenced by the neoclassicists and formal study of Greek and Roman sculpture was considered essential training for the young artist. Delacroix was impressed by the work of the old masters, particularly Michelangelo and Raphael. He studied the masterpieces of the Louvre, and he copied the works of the Venetian masters, Veronese and Titian. These were painters famed for their strength of colour. So was a 17th century Flemish artist, whose influence on Delacroix proved strongest of all, Peter Paul Rubens. Rubens was a great influence on Delacroix, first and foremost, I think, because Rubens was a colourist, and Delacroix was somebody who, in a sense, was rediscovering colour, or showing how much you could do with colour, how important it was in paintings. Then Rubens has this great ebullience in his painting. He seems to draw with the brush a lot. They have a tremendous vigour. Delacroix emulates that vigour, though he gives it a rather darker and more savage tonality. But I think there are other ways in which Rubens was important for Delacroix. Rubens was, as we know, a courtier. He was a highly intelligent, highly educated person. Uh, he very much gave the impression of the artist as gentleman, the artist as educated person. And this is very much what Delacroix himself was. He was, in a sense, you might say, somebody who was mourning the time of Rubens. He felt he was living in a lost world. He was rather disdainful of the bourgeoisie. Rubens was a kind of ideal as a person, I think, as well as a painter. Rubens' works are all about movement and warmth of colour and defining forms with broad and rhythmical brush strokes of bright colour. And I think this encouraged Delacroix in a direction that he'd already chosen to move in anyway. Delacroix, like Rubens, broke up the colour and applied it in these short rhythmical dabs. Unlike some artists who travelled to Italy to see the work of Raphael and Michelangelo, Delacroix went to Brussels and he went to Amsterdam and he went to Antwerp and he looked at Rubens. He must have found Rubens an enormous inspiration when it came to doing the large-scale decorative projects. A respect for the past is evident in much of Delacroix's early work. In this religious image from 1821, we can see the influence of Raphael. While this self-portrait revealed a young artist's enthusiasm for the Spanish master, Velasquez. Although Delacroix became known as the leader of French Romantic painting, and his arch enemy was considered to be Ingres, the champion of the neoclassicist school, Delacroix could not be described as a revolutionary figure. He had as much respect for the work of the old masters as anyone. Some years later, when this 1826 Delacroix was shown, the critic Charles Baudelaire compared it to the work of both Michelangelo and Rubens, and the artist would have appreciated his sentiments. Delacroix combined the old and the new, and Baudelaire was in no doubt that he succeeded. He described Delacroix as the last of the great artists of the Renaissance and the first of the modern age. The influence of Delacroix's neoclassicist contemporary, Jacques-Louis David, 
is evident in this intriguing 1818 image. This is Elizabeth Salter, an English maid who worked for Delacroix's sister. She was the artist's first love, but the romance did not lead to a permanent relationship. It would be the same story throughout his life. Though Delacroix enjoyed many long-lasting love affairs, he never married and did not have children. His real passion was for his work. For his first great public work, he chose to depict an event described in Dante's Inferno. With this 1822 canvas, The Bark of Dante, a young artist announced himself to the world. The painting was a major success at the official annual exhibition of French art, the Salon. Delacroix's career was now well underway. The poet Dante is being guided through the underworld by Virgil, and they're crossing the river Styx, and the damned are trying to get into the boat. So you can see that there are figures trying to clamber into the boat. Virgil is protecting Dante during this ordeal, because Virgil had been in the underworld for hundreds and hundreds of years. Dante was a new visitor, so all the scenes to Dante seemed horrible and gruesome, so he's being supported by the experienced Virgil. Delacroix seems to have always been at his best when he could mould himself into the situation of the subjects. And of course he could liken the experience of Dante, the poet who goes through hell to find his experiences, to what an artist has to do. It was an image which was seen as, or has been labelled, a manifesto of romanticism. The uh, image appealed in its kind of monumentality and in its imaginative vision to a new generation who wanted something more, more exciting, more visually stimulating. It wasn't just the excited youth who thought this was a, a wonderful picture. Gros, that you know, arch-conservative history painter, thought it was wonderful and subsequently invited Delacroix to visit him in his studio. It was officially praised. It won Delacroix honours. It seemed to announce Delacroix as a kind of great hope of French painting. Earlier, Delacroix had posed for this enigmatic portrait. It was painted by his fellow artist and friend, Théodore Géricault. Another remarkable painting by Géricault had a profound impression on Delacroix when it went on display in Paris in 1819. The Raft of the Medusa, a huge canvas depicting the survivors of a shipwreck, had radical implications for his artistic development. The Raft of the Medusa was a very bold statement on Géricault's part, and it really stood out like a sore thumb in the 1819 Salon when it was exhibited there. It was the only work to be done on a huge scale that had nothing to do with ancient history painting or mythological painting or religious painting. It was about a contemporary event and a very scandalous contemporary event, and it even attacked the Ministry of the Navy. So it was a very daring, adventurous move on Jericho's part. Jericho's Raft of the Medusa is one of the most extraordinary paintings of all time. A huge, overwhelming canvas showing this dramatic shipwreck, but showing it in a heroic way. The figures are all very large, and it is a wonderful example of a picture that on one hand obeys the rules of history painting, being very large and heroic, but on another hand is very modern. It's about despair, it's about people fearing they're going to lose their lives. There's no hero in the picture. And I think it was that combination of tradition and modernity that so fascinated Delacroix. He could see here a painter who could, shall we say, bring out all the apparatus of the ground machine, paint an overwhelming, vast picture showing a wonderful command of anatomy, of structure and design, colour, tonality, all the things that the history painter should do, and yet at the same time dealing with a modern tragedy, something that touched people, that had affected people at the time. And I think this is what Delacroix wanted to bring the two together. The Raft of the Medusa was a painting of a contemporary event, and viewers are not spared any of the horrors endured by the shipwreck victims. Both of these features identify Géricault's masterpiece as a romantic work of art. Tragically, Géricault died in 1824 at the age of just 33 leaving Delacroix to take up the baton of French romantic painting. <laughs>
In the same year as Jericho's death, this huge canvas proclaimed the romantic credentials of his surviving friend. This is the Massacre of Chios, one of only three Delacroix works to take its subject matter from contemporary events. At the time, the people of Greece were engaged in a bloody war of independence against the Turks. In Paris, as elsewhere in Europe, the Greek cause was widely supported in artistic circles. When thousands of Greeks were slaughtered on the island of Chios, cultured European society was outraged. It was this event that Delacroix turned into an image of passion, violence and colour. This was the painting that established Delacroix as the leading figure of the growing romantic school of Parisian art. Its appearance was appropriately timed. In 1824, the Greek War of Independence claimed its most famous victim, the English romantic poet Lord Byron. Delacroix strongly admired Byron's poetry, and some of his finest paintings were inspired by his work. Byron, for Delacroix, represented someone who was a sort of larger-than-life character, someone who lived his art. Byron espouses the Greek cause of independence and dies at Missolonghi. Delacroix was a great Anglophile. He goes to England in 1825. He had English lessons. And so he felt that the English tradition in painting and in literature could provide an alternative to the mostly Italian influences that many of his contemporaries were following. In the person of Byron, in the persona of Byron, he would have found a very attractive character, a very dramatic character, very attractive to women, but also a very rebellious spirit, and also someone who was prepared to fight for a cause that he believed in. But when it comes to Byron's works, it's the tales that he is drawn to. And there are about a dozen of them that he draws inspiration from for his works. He works with these throughout his life. It's the tragedy. It's the despair in a love story. It's sometimes danger, persecution. It's always dramatic tension. Byron was not the only literary giant to influence Delacroix's work. He was also an admirer of Sir Walter Scott. This early self-portrait shows the artist dressed as the hero of Scott's novel, The Bride of Lammermoor. Delacroix also loved Shakespeare's tragedies and was particularly inspired by Hamlet. This 1839 image of Hamlet and Horatio in the graveyard is one of four memorable paintings which portray the Prince of Denmark. Shakespeare's Hamlet also inspired a collection of lithographs later in Delacroix's career. Delacroix's passion for Shakespeare originated in 1825 when he spent a summer in England. It was a mixed experience for him. Overall, he rated the cultural life of London as inferior to that of Paris. But the 27-year-old artist did appreciate the superb performances of Shakespeare on the London stage. He also enjoyed time in the English countryside. This was the land that inspired a contemporary English artist, a man whose work had been well received in Paris John Constable. Although Delacroix did not manage to meet Constable during his stay in England, he had seen the English artist's most famous painting, The Haywain, at the Paris Salon in 1824. At the time, Delacroix was working on his Massacre at Chios. After seeing The Haywain, he felt compelled to alter his own painting. Delacroix was most impressed by the freshness of the Haywain. In the context of official painting in the 1820s, the Haywain was like a breath of fresh air. It was painted in this very vivid, intense, naturalistic way. 
and Delacroix talked in particular, for example, about how Constable was able to get a vivid effect with greens by having many different types of greens together so that it didn't look dull, so that it looked lively. He liked the way that Constable broke up his paintwork. Typically of Delacroix, he didn't just copy it, he borrowed from it, he took things from it, and he used this as a way to lighten the effects of his landscape in the Massacre of Skios. He made the whole thing lighter, and this was to be a lesson he was then to carry on into other pictures. John Constable is regarded by many as the greatest English Romantic painter. Delacroix's admiration for him was confirmed by his decision to repaint the Massacre of Chios. But the French painter did not share Constable's passion for landscape. Only later in his career did he turn his hand to the genre. When he did, the results were remarkable. But this is not typical de la Croix subject matter. Throughout his career, his favourite subjects were generally limited to historical events, exotic scenes of the East, and, especially, scenes from literature. It was a Byron play that inspired one of the artist's most dramatic paintings of his career. The Death of Sardanapalus. The play was based on the story of an Assyrian king. The drama concludes with Sardanapalus committing suicide rather than surrender to his besieging enemies. In Byron's version of the story, the king's best-loved concubine chooses to die with him, but Delacroix suggests a far more violent conclusion. In his painting, the king orders the death of all his women before he dies himself, and the horror is for all to see. This is a swirling orgy of violence, movement and colour. It is so filled with charge and energy, dynamism. This is a man who has determined on whole-scale destruction and slaughter, and it seems to be kind of almost reveling in it, enjoying it in the peculiar way that Delacroix has portrayed it. That very confrontational element to it seems to make it very important. The way that correctness of perspective is sacrificed to energy and dynamism and to particular kinds of perspective that, uh, that Delacroix was trying to achieve. I mean, technically, that's what makes it a jarring work and one which remains fascinating to scholars. It's about violence, the erotic. You see these naked female figures in the foreground in exactly the kind of twisted and contorted movements that he learned from Rubens. It's probably not surprising that it caused quite a stir in the Salon. The critics, partly because it was based on a Byron play, some of the critics were very negative about it and felt that it had violated all those French classical rules about the unity of time and place and action. I think a lot of people felt that he'd overstepped the mark. Delacroix exhibited the death of Sardanapalus at the Salon in 1827. That year, he also showed another canvas inspired by a Byron drama. This is The Execution of the Doge Marino Faliero, a work associated with one of the better known stories of Byron's career. It is said that while painting this canvas, the artist grew frustrated with the lack of sparkle in the gold clothes. So he decided to visit the Louvre to see if the brilliant colours used by Rubens could solve his difficulties. It was while he was getting into his cab that he first noticed a ray of sunlight casting a violet shadow on the ground beside the yellow cab. The yellow became more intense as a result. Eugène Delacroix had discovered the effects of complementary colour. The theory of complementary colours was that you have the three primaries, red, yellow and blue, and that if you take any one of them, the shadow is going to be made up of the combination of the other two. So the complementary colour of red is the mixture of yellow and blue, which is green. So therefore, red and green is a colour harmony that very often turns up in Delacroix's paintings. If we think of something like the women of Algiers that's painted in the 1830s, we see juxtapositions of red and green uh, in numerous areas of the paint surface. 
People sometimes say that he was the first artist to use complementary colours. Well, that isn't actually true. You can find people using complementary colours going right back into history. So perhaps one of the most impressive examples of this is the way he uses colour contrast in the women of Algiers, the colours looming in the shadows. And he was aware that shadows were as full of colour as were objects that were in broad daylight. It was very important for the Impressionists. They saw Delacroix using this to some extent already, and this gave them a springboard to go further. And you might say there's a whole tradition of sophisticated colour painting that has come out of that. An intense and often dramatic sense of colour is the most characteristic feature of Delacroix's work. A dynamic sense of movement can also be seen in many of his finest paintings, and this combination of colour and movement links him with his great predecessor Rubens. Like Rubens, Delacroix loved painting scenes full of dramatic action. We can see this in images such as The Lion Hunt. This was a subject that had inspired Rubens, and Delacroix also succeeded in capturing a sense of bloody violence. Delacroix, like Rubens, was a master of painting horses, as we can see in this 1831 canvas of the medieval Battle of Nancy. This was a work commissioned three years earlier by the King of France himself, Charles X. But by the time the canvas was completed, Charles was no longer on the throne. He had been overthrown by the dramatic events of the July Revolution, a Parisian uprising opposed to Charles' reactionary policies. It was a triumph for liberalism against dictatorship. And on August the 9th, 1830, the constitutional monarch, Louis-Philippe, took the French throne. The artistic community was ecstatic. At the Salon exhibition of 1831, no fewer than 23 artists presented work glorifying the July Revolution. Only one is known today. The most famous of all Delacroix's paintings, Liberty Leading the People. What Delacroix does is to introduce this allegorical figure bang in the middle of the composition, the Liberty figure. She's very forceful. She's a combination of a Greek statue, you see her face in profile, she's strong, and a real woman with whom the people surrounding her in the image could identify. And people make quite a lot of comment about the fact that she's got hairy armpits and dirty feet and so on. She's not actually there at all. She's an idealized allegorical figure representing the notion of liberty. Its essence lies in its combination of earthiness, an earthy reality, if you like, a sense of dirt, of confusion, of the kind of energy and excitement of a real street occasion, and that very allegorical, symbolic overtone which allows him to sort of portray classes in togetherness. I think it's fair to say that Delacroix was no Courbet, uh, and that he was really involved in the events of 1830 more as an observer than as an active and enthusiastic participant. Liberty Leading the People was a huge popular and critical success. Appropriately, it was purchased for 3,000 francs by the new king, Louis Philippe. It remains a powerful image of rebellion and revolution. This was the third of Delacroix's paintings to be inspired by contemporary events. It was also the last. He was now 32 years old and free to pursue his own artistic agenda. In the years that followed, he painted this revealing image of himself. Here we see a confident, successful man. Delacroix's friends described him as a caged tiger, a man with a suppressed inner violence. Perhaps we can see the spirit of the tiger in this deeply romantic portrait. By the time this canvas was completed in 1839, 
Delacroix's work was becoming increasingly focused on two areas. Decorations for the public buildings of Paris and canvases for exhibition at the annual Salon. Many of these were exotic images inspired by the East. From the very beginning of his career, Delacroix liked to paint sensuous nudes in the guise of the Eastern slave girl or concubine. But these early canvases were inspired by the artist's imagination and his reading. In his first 33 years, Delacroix hardly left Paris, let alone traveled to the Orient. But in early 1832, he was invited to accompany a French nobleman on a visit to North Africa. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and he seized it. In January that year, he set off for Morocco. His art would never be the same again. For Delacroix, the experience of the East was absolutely crucial. For two things, really. Because of the intensity of colour that he experienced, the light, in North Africa was much brighter than anything he'd ever seen. But he also felt that by seeing the Arab civilization, he saw a culture that was just as old as antiquity, but had been unbroken. One of his celebrated sayings was that these are the true Greeks and Romans. It was as though he'd gone back to the ancient world. And he liked to use that as a stick, in a sense, to beat the neoclassicists who were trying to revive Greek art. There are all the qualities of the ancient world you can find in these people who are living in a much more natural way than we are. So it was the experience of this more natural world, in his sense, that was important, and it gave him a whole new repertoire of subjects. We are privileged to have an important insight into Delacroix's North African travels. As at other times in his career, he kept a detailed journal describing his experiences. He also made a vast number of sketches, filling four albums with images he had created at an amazing speed. This was a trademark of Delacroix's art. He once said that if you couldn't sketch a man in the time it took him to fall from a five-story building, then you did not have the skill to be an artist. Delacroix's own sketching abilities were confirmed by his African journey. For years later, he used these sketches as inspiration for his African paintings. An early example was Women of Algiers. A scene of life and color with less dramatic movement than much of Delacroix's work. But with another 1838 canvas, the artist chose to paint an African scene which is almost entirely action. The Fanatics of Tangier depicts an actual event witnessed and sketched by Delacroix. What we see is a bizarre ritual performed by fanatical Muslims known as Isawis. We can see the frenzy of the people, but the action takes place within a strong compositional framework. This concern for solidity of setting can also be seen in a canvas regarded by many as the finest of Delacroix's African paintings, The Jewish Wedding. Delacroix carries on using his experiences from the East. He paints The Jewish Wedding in 1841. He actually attended, as a privileged guest, a Jewish wedding in Tangiers. Now, to him, it seemed a great problem of space, how to depict this. How do you show all the movement and also the underlying architecture? So we, we've almost got a kind of panoramic painting. We become a guest while all this action is unfolding. Delacroix is also faced in this painting with the problems of intense light and shadow. So the Jewish wedding as a whole, is, I think, is a brilliant demonstration of this ability to keep all these differing elements together. It's a very impressive canvas, both in its modelling of distinct groups with their particular physiognomies and with a sense of energy being built up, but there's something that reminiscent of the monumentality of ancient architecture in that space. 
there's overtones or feelings that there's a hint that he's referring to Veronese, to large scale conceptions in the Venetian tradition of wedding scenes, etc. You know, in other words, that he brings to bear much that is external to direct observation onto the construction of the space. The Jewish wedding was exhibited at the Salon of 1841, some nine years after Delacroix had returned from Africa but his sketchbooks continued to inspire his paintings. Four years later, Salon viewers could appreciate the Sultan of Morocco surrounded by his court, another painting of a scene that Delacroix had witnessed for himself. Here, more than anywhere else, we can see the magnificence of the African sky captured by a master of color. When this canvas was first shown, Eugène de la Croix was 47 years of age and his life was increasingly dominated by work. By day, he could be found at his studio on the Rue Notre-Dame de la Lorette. At night, he returned to his home in the forest of Fontainebleau, where he was cared for by his housekeeper, Eugénie Le Guillou. He now suffered from a throat condition and he often found the physical business of work exhausting. But his output remained remarkable as he took on a series of commissions to decorate some of the most famous buildings of his home city. This was a task whose origins dated back to the beginning of Delacroix's career. When the Bark of Dante was shown at the 1822 Salon, it made a strong impression upon the journalist Adolphe Thiers. Eleven years later, Thiers was a minister in the French government and keen to commission a mural decoration for the throne room at the Palais Bourbon. To carry out the work, he asked the artist whose debut canvas he had so admired. The commission meant that Delacroix would be working on a larger scale than ever before, and he grasped the opportunity. Delacroix's interest in mural work and was inspired by his love of kind of the monumental, of grand scale conceptions. I think he really did believe in himself as a painter in that grand scale tradition, someone who could intellectually keep together a large scheme with coherence, but with dynamism, with energy. And you know, there are echoes of his kind of aspiration to Michelangelo, to Veronese, to others, in that desire. And I think that, you know, therefore the, the grand scale of these commissions tended to suit him very well. From 1833 onwards, the final three decades of Delacroix's working life were dominated by mural commissions. To execute them, he used an oil paint mixed with wax, and the result was monumental images such as the allegorical figure of justice in the Palais Bourbon throne room. In the same building, he also worked on the decorations for the library, a task which occupied him from 1843 until 1847. Such a labor was hardly surprising. The work involved painting two half domes each covering an area of over 700 square feet. To fill this vast area, Delacroix chose to paint what he considered to be the birth and death of classical civilization, the civilizing of the Greeks by Orpheus and Attila the Huns' triumph over the Romans. The work was well received. Before long, Delacroix was painting in the gallery where he had first encountered the greatest old masters, the Louvre. He chose the god Apollo slaying the python as the theme for the Galerie d'Apoyon. Like all Delacroix's mural commissions, the work involved painstaking and sometimes painful effort. but the results are seen by many as the greatest triumph of all Delacroix's commissions. When Delacroix's painting his great murals, he's faced with the problems of how do you give form to abstract notions. 
So quite naturally, he turns to the classics. We know he's a great reader of the classics. He had a classical education. So in order to show abstract virtues and ideas, he took scenes from Ovid, Seneca, and classical authors. Many of these public buildings were for politicians, and so he surrounded these politicians with lessons of virtue. So they simply needed to look up to be shown how their political careers should be influenced by the, the manners and morals of antiquity. Delacroix was a profound pessimist in his thinking, and he felt that civilization had led to the destruction of certain values in mankind. There's a very good example of that in the ceiling paintings he did for the Library of the Chamber of Deputies, where you see the history of civilization, but it's also the history of the collapse of civilization, of the noble classical world being compromised more and more by what goes on in the modern world. So I think that Delacroix felt he'd really been given his range there, not just to show himself as an intelligent painter of visual effect, but as somebody who could handle a whole conceptual theme, which is what you found in these large mural paintings. Delacroix's decorations for the Louvre were completed in 1851. But another decade of mural work lay ahead. It was a tiring business for an artist now in his 50s. Friends described how he could barely bring himself to speak at the end of a day's work, and his throat condition was now increasingly serious. He still found some time for relaxation. He enjoyed the company of the composer Frédéric Chopin and his mistress, the novelist Georges Chand. He painted portraits of both of them and enjoyed a number of enjoyable summer breaks at Sand's country residence. He found the time to sit for this early photograph and his later years were comforted by increasing official recognition of his achievements. In 1857, he was elected to the Institute on his eighth attempt, two years after a successful exhibition of his work at the Universal Exposition. Delacroix's work remained his first priority until the end of his life. As well as his many decorative commissions, he continued to paint a large number of conventional canvases. Many of these were familiar in the source of their inspiration. This 1840 canvas shows the shipwreck of Don Juan, inspired by another Byron play. Its composition clearly recalls the greatest work by Géricault. But Delacroix's final years also produced a small number of images very different from his usual output. As his health began to fail, he chose to spend more time away from Paris. In 1852, he visited the port of Dieppe. While he was there, he painted this atmospheric seascape. This was a small, personal work, not intended for public show. This small image was owned by Edgar Dugas, and, after him, Auguste Renoir. The sea at Dieppe would prove to be one of the most influential images of Delacroix's career. The Impressionists saw him as one of their heroes. There is an account of them once watching him painting and being amazed even at the end of his life, his tremendous concentration, his tremendous vigour. He was a hero figure for them, somebody who had stood out against the authorities and who had triumphs. But he was also a technical hero because he had shown the way that colour could be used in new ways. Now, he was doing that largely in the context of historical subjects. They took that into modern life and into direct painting out of doors. His later still lifes were also of great interest to fellow artists. In the late 1840s, Delacroix often stayed at the country residence of his novelist friend, Georges Sand. While there, he took time to paint the flowers in her garden. The resulting images were like nothing he had ever painted before, but their value would be recognized by a later generation of painters. The last quarter of the 19th century was one of the most exciting periods in the history of art. <laughs> 
first the Impressionists, then the Post-Impressionists, brought painting into the modern age. Many of these great artists were passionate admirers of Delacroix's later experimental work. This still life was eventually purchased by Paul Cézanne. While the view of the sea at Dieppe can be seen as preempting the Impressionist movement as a whole, some critics have suggested that the real importance of Delacroix is not his work in itself, but the influence it had on the generations that followed. Even after the Impressionists, there are many artists that look to Delacroix as examples of how to use and manipulate colour. We know Van Gogh copies some of Delacroix's religious works. Cézanne paints an apotheosis of Delacroix in the 1880s. And then the Neo-Impressionists, those artists that are using individual small dots, seize on Delacroix and Signac, one of the main Neo-Impressionist artists, writes a book called From Eugene Delacroix to Neo-Impressionism. So he was seen as a kind of father figure of colour theory. Picasso is a wonderful example of an artist who was interested in Delacroix's work, especially the painting of the women of Algiers. He does a number of versions of that. You can always recognize that Delacroix's women of Algiers are behind them, but he was obviously really intrigued by that painting, partly, I think, by Delacroix's use of complementary colors that's very noticeable in that particular painting, but also, I think, the atmosphere that Delacroix created in that painting there's a static quality which is very unusual for Delacroix's works and the female figures, two of them at least, face the spectator very directly and almost challenge the spectator and something of that Picasso picks up in his different versions of the Women of Algiers. Delacroix died in Paris on August the 13th, 1863. He was 65 years old. For four decades, he had been a major figure in French artistic life, and his influence did not end with his death. In life, his achievement was remarkable, and his status as the greatest French Romantic painter is still recognized today. Delacroix is certainly one of the truly great painters of all time. He was considered at the time as being almost, so to speak, the last of the old masters. And in one sense, one can see that, that it's almost as though he's drawing to a conclusion something that had been set up by Michelangelo and by Rubens. He is the last of those great monumental painters. But at the same time, he's the first of the moderns. Strangely enough, Delacroix remains a kind of enigma. There are many and multiple contradictions. This was a man who created these intensely passionate works, but at the same time always insisted, je suis un pur classique. I'm a pure classicist. Baudelaire, who was probably the greatest commentator on Delacroix's art, said that he was a volcanic crater artistically concealed behind bouquets of flowers. <laughs>